Let me see if that one. All right. And let me uh, pull up the first picture here. Where am I going to start? Uh, it's so, so confusing. Uh, so before I bring up the first picture, I'd just like to talk uh, a little bit about what we're going to see today. Um, you know, I keep thinking about the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and uh, I've always had a fascination, I think, for things that move. So whether it's planes, trains, and ships for me more than automobiles. But uh, I mentioned in past talks when we were talking about New York and that my father was actually in the shipping business, and he was in commercial shipping. He worked uh, uh, bringing all sorts of freight and everything into the United States. And he worked for a number of companies over the years and ended up doing 20 plus years of the company called NYK, Nippon Yusin and Kaisha Lines, which is a tremendous uh, Japanese shipping company. During it, uh, some of the ships that he had back in that period of time actually had passenger accommodations on them. So some of the smaller freighters, you could actually take a cruise on a, 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 a cargo ship and they had very nice accommodations because the officers all ate in style and everything. And you could go off island hopping and that sort of thing. And sometimes you didn't know when you were getting on where you were going to get off because the uh, ships were picking up cargo and being rerouted during it. But it was a nice thing for him that he got to sail on some of his company ships and see how they operated. And of course, then my mom had to go. Well, she got hooked on, uh, on cruising. Before we forget, let me just... Uh, Mute everybody here for one second. Uh, so my mom got uh, hooked on cruising and went on a ship and they, they went on quite a few. And even though he was now in the commercial shipping side, a lot of the lines extended courtesy visits or discounts off to people and they were able to go on quite a few cruises. As we'll see in some of the pictures from some of their cruises, I think they also liked the fact that uh, they were going with uh, other adults and they could leave me and my four brothers behind and they could get a, a reset to sanity for some of the, their time. But cruising was a lot different back in the uh, 50s, 60s and 70s when my folks were doing this in a big time as uh, Tom was just mentioning. Cruise ships have totally changed. Uh, behind me we have one of our uh, favorite ships, the SS United States, uh, during one of its New York visits. Back then, these ships were built for uh, basically two things, speed and uh, with a lesser attention comfort. The speed was to get you across the Atlantic Ocean as fast as possible because it was too expensive for most people to go via plane. Uh, jet travel, of course, started killing all that. But you know, planes, you had to make several stops. You had to uh, you know, stop in Newfoundland or other places. And it was expensive. So passenger ship travel was a big thing. You know, back in the 30s, you had the, the days of the Queen Mary, then later years, you had the uh, Queen Elizabeth and uh, other ships in the United States behind me. But they had a big thing to see who could get across the ocean the fastest. And they had a trophy, the Blue Riband, which was given to the fastest uh, ship to go across the Atlantic. Very, just like the Guinness Book of Records, you know, with very rigorous uh, uh, things of where you started, when you ended up who is going to observe it. And uh, these ships would constantly out, try to outdo each other because if you could pronounce that you had the fastest ship and everybody else would took six days to get across the Atlantic Ocean and you only took five and a half. Well, that was like the big thing for the Concorde that you could get to England that much faster than if you flew in a 747. So the ships were really, really built for speed. As we'll see in a moment, they were not as necessarily the most comfortable. They did not have Tremendous things like we have today with uh, gyro stabilizers and uh, uh, other uh, stabilizers that wings that swing out from under the, the hull line and uh, keeps the ships from tossing and turning. So with that, let me jump to the first picture here. And I will uh, bring up, let me just get to it real quick. I got to get myself ready here. We're going to go and jump on a ship called the Liberté. And uh, this will give me an idea of just what transatlantic travel was like back in the time. So let me find where I open it here. Open. Okay, let me close this one second. It did not open the window I wanted. There's the window I want. You think by now I'd know what I was doing, right? Well, you'd be wrong. Okay, all right, here we go. So here is a, a trip across the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean in the middle of a uh, winter. 
Uh, the Liberty was built in uh, 1930 and it sailed as the Europa. It was a, uh, a ship built in Germany. And uh, she and her sister ship, the, uh, the uh, uh, Bremen, the original Bremen, both won the Blue Riband and uh, they sailed under the German flag until World War II. Uh, they, at the end of World War II, was given to the French as a war prize to make up for a partial loss of the SS Normandy, one of the uh, premier cruise ships of all time. Uh, so we're going to take a look. You can see the, the up on the upper deck. And the upper deck is kind of going way back and way forth. Uh, she's hanging on for dear life and looking at it. But this is the sort of uh, way these things would toss and turn. Again, they, they were meant to get across the ocean fast. Uh, in later years, people realized I, uh, you know, being seasick for the better part of five or six days was not uh, very good. Tom and uh, Z and Carol and I could kind of relate to this because when we took the cruise down to Bermuda together, it was stormy the entire way down. They closed off all the open uh, decks because they didn't want anybody falling off. And they, uh, uh, we had a nice time when we were there and then they closed off all the decks on the way back. So we never got really to walk outside. But uh, you can see that uh, transatlantic travel was a, a big time. The Liberty served, uh, sailed until 1961. At that point, the uh, SS France, a, a massive new liner, arrived on the scene and it was uh, retired and it was eventually scrapped in uh, 1962. But uh, very rough uh, trip going across the, uh, the ocean. So we're going to jump back here. I've got these kind of scheduled, uh, thrown around all over the place. We're going to go way back to 1939 and show you uh, ships that are visiting New York City. Now, we may have seen a couple of these when you're talking about New York City. But I'm going to try to give you some information on uh, each of these ships. This was done something called Fleet Week. Uh, the United States Navy made a big, big thing about bringing all of its ships back to the United States into port for Fleet Week. And you'd have Fleet Week in New York, Fleet Week in San Francisco, Fleet Week in LA. And it was a really great way of putting the uh, massive armament of the uh, United States Navy on display. Uh, both to let everybody know where all their tax dollars were going as the uh, uh, Navy was being built up in preparation for the uh, predicted World War coming, but also just kind of show the, the rest of the world how many ships we had and, and what they looked like. So this is the USS Philadelphia. It was a Brooklyn-class light cruiser. People think of the Philadelphia Experiment, the science fiction story and movie about a ship being uh, teleported in time and space. That was not the USS Philadelphia. It was done at the Philadelphia shipyard, the setting for the story. So when people see this, they go, ah, oh, the Philadelphia story. Nothing to do whatsoever with the movie. This ship was commissioned in 1937, sailed in uh, World War II with a very uh, uh, good uh, uh, record of service. I'm not going to go into all the details for all the World War II service these ships, because some of them fought amazing number of battles with uh, uh, getting some very nice awards for their time. This was sold in 1951 to Argentina and became one of the top ships in the Navy. And it was uh, lasted with the Argentine Navy until 1974 when it was sold for, uh, for scrap. Bigger ship here is the USS New York. This is a battleship, um, one of the very old battleships. It was built in 1914. And by the time of World War II, it was pretty well worn out. It was lucky it did not get attacked in Pearl Harbor uh, because it was actually out of the uh, uh, service at that time being refitted in a shipyard, uh, much less armament and everything than the World War II era ships that uh, they came to be. Uh, it, it was rapidly restored into service because most of our uh, World War II ships were now sitting at the bottom of the harbor at Pearl Harbor following the Japanese attack. So ships like this, and 30 something, 40 years old for a warship is a pretty long period of time, particularly back then. Uh, but the United States Navy absolutely needed these ships put into service and it had a very good uh, career during uh, World War II. After World War II, they decided to use it for the atomic bomb tests over in the Bikini Atoll. It survived uh, not one, but two atomic bomb blasts. So these things were built to last. Uh, it was brought back to Pearl Harbor, studied for, uh, to see the effects of radiation, the effects of the uh, concussion waves and the blast on it. And it was finally in 1948 taken out to sea 
sunk in target practice, and it took a lot more of uh, uh, the shells and uh, salvos than they thought to bring it down. So when they built these things, they, they built them pretty tough. Um, another view of it, they had these giant masts up top where you would go up for the artillery spotting because these uh, sh guns on these ships could basically throw something the size of a Volkswagen 20 something miles. Huge, huge uh, guns. But because they were going so far, they had to have these very tall uh, masts, they called them a tripod mast, so the people up top could get an idea of where uh, the shells were going to go, since they were basically going further than the people down below on the bridge could see. This was all in the days pre-radar. Uh, it was all done with uh, guys with telescopes and uh, tools and everything, trying to figure out where the, uh, uh, the shells would, would land. Another light cruiser, another one of the Brooklyn class, this is the USS Nashville. Again, this is all during Fleet Week 1939 in uh, New York. This one was commissioned in 1938. It lasted with the United States Navy until 1951, sold to Chile, and it lasted with the Chilean Navy until 1985. Again, a long time for, for some of these ships. This is the Brooklyn, the namesake uh, uh, ship of the Brooklyn class. Sorry, some of these photos have not yet restored yet, so you can see uh, all the various dirt and everything on it. Uh, this particular one was the first in its class, was commissioned in 1937, and it has an interesting little bit of history, which uh, most people won't realize. But comedian Lenny Bruce, he a foul mouth uh, comic fame that get arrested for saying things that you can't say back then. He actually served on this for two years during World War II, and his job was passing uh, shells from the ma uh, uh, ammo magazine up to the guns. So uh, the Brooklyn was sold to Chile in 1951. It was uh, sold for scrap in 1992, but it sunk on its way to the scrappers. And we're gonna hear that line repeated over and over and over again. So I'm gonna give you advice right now. If you're in the insurance business and somebody says, I wanna insure my ship uh, and I'm gonna be selling it over to India or some other place to scrap it, do not insure that ship. We are going to see ship after ship after ship today that mysteriously sunk on, on the way to the scrappers, which uh, every single time it happens, people bring up claims of insurance fraud. But whatever the reason is, maybe they're just worn out or maybe they are uh, being sunk on purpose. The number of them that have sunk is just truly uh, astonishing. Another ship from the Brooklyn class, they must have had most of the Brooklyn class uh, in visiting the folks in New York. This is the USS Honolulu. Uh, this was the uh, 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 ship was built in 1938. This one was at Pearl Harbor during the attack, uh, received very little damage luckily and was quickly repaired and put back in the service. And another ship that served with a great uh, distinction during the period of time. Lasted a number of years longer in the United States Navy until 1960. Uh, unlike its sister ships, it was not sold to a foreign Navy. It was just taken out and it was uh, scrapped. One more, I think this is the last of the Brooklyn class cruisers, the USS Savannah. You can see uh, back in the uh, uh, distance, uh, some other things, uh, you know, uh, buildings that people might start recognizing. But the Savannah was built in 1938, and it was also scrapped along with the uh, Honolulu in 1960. And we're going to hop up. This is interesting where you have to be careful in trying to uh, do research on pictures. This is labeled as the SS Britannic. It is not actually the SS Britannic. It is the MV Britannic. And the reason is it's not a steamship. SS, again, stands for steamships. So if you have the SS United States, it was powered by steam. Water put into boilers, uh, the uh, steam is heated up, turns turbines and drives the ship. Other ships did not use that. They would use uh, uh, turbines, they would use uh, diesel engines, all sorts of things. So the, folk, the fellow that took this hand labeled all these negatives and this was all done basically by somebody taking a pen or sharp, or sharp object and scratching it onto the actual negative and he's labeled as the SS Britannic, but it's actually the motor vessel Britannic. This was an old one built in 1929. You can see how low the stacks are on this particular one. They could be lower stacks because they weren't burning a lot of coal. So you didn't end up with a lot of uh, soot and debris coming down all the passengers and their finery. 
This was the last uh, surviving liner of the old White Star line. Basically, England had the White Star and the Canard lines were the big uh, uh, people, uh, ships, companies fighting for survival. You had, just like here, you had Pan Am versus TWA versus American. Well, over in England, you had uh, all sorts of shipping lines, but the two big ones were the White Star and the Canard, and uh, I think White Star was the, uh, the Titanic folks, if I remember right. Uh, this one sailed back and forth for years. Like many of these ships, it was used as a uh, uh, troop ship during World War II, restored to service and so, uh, used as, for cruising. Uh, this one was finally scrapped in uh, 1960. Bows on view of it. And we talked uh, uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was, about tugboats and how uh, popular they were. The tugboats had to bring these ships into port uh, because basically the ships only had the big propellers in the back for speed. Today, you have all sorts of changes to ships. Uh, you have all sorts of thrusters, bow thrusters, stern stress, uh, thrusters that you can actually make the ship stop dead and move it sideways under its own power. Some of them are engines or uh, openings that go from side of the hull to the other and, and push the water through. Others have pods that they uh, can swivel around on the uh, bottom of the ship and, and manipulate it. But back in this day, the uh, tugboats were absolutely essential for coming along and warping the ship up to its uh, dock. So um, as the cruise ships changed and the, uh, as the whole shipping industry changed, the tugboat industry uh, really died down as well. Smaller ship here, this is a destroyer escort. This is the USS Janssen, destroyer escort number 396. Uh, these were smaller than uh, destroyers, and uh, they, they really, if you wanted to go out to sea and get wet, a destroyer escort is the way to do it. Uh, you can see how low to the water this thing is in the back. They were built for convoy escort purposes. Uh, they were built to be very, very fast and very, very maneuverable, but they were also, they took on water like crazy. Uh, this particular one was built in uh, 1943 and served in uh, uh, convoy duty until 1946, and then it uh, sat in storage and was uh, finally scrapped in 1973. The destroyer escort is the first type of Navy ship I went on out of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, another one out of this class, and uh, we were in very mild weather, and I could safely say they took on water even in very mild uh, weather. But these ships were absolutely essential. They could build these things in amazing uh, periods of time. They were built in shipboard, shipyards all up and down the east and west coast, and even out on the Great Lakes. They were uh, built out on a number of the, the uh, lakes, brought out by the canals out and put into service. So these ships were a very, very uh, uh, essential vessels during World War II. This kind of interesting one, this is the US, uh, uh, the, the ship is called Firefighter. It was a, a firefighting ship for the uh, New York City Fire Department, uh, launched in 1938. And you can see all these nozzles up in the front. There's the one up in the front, a number up on the top. It had an amazing uh, tonnage of water that it could pump out at a, a particular moment. Firefighter was uh, custom built as a fire boat and it uh, had really been designed to be the premier firefighting ship in the uh, uh, fire department fleet. It stayed in service from 1938 until uh, 2010 this serves at over 50 major fires. Uh, the uh, uh, Normandy fire I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, there was a ship, two ships that collided under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. They burned so badly they thought the bridge might come down. This was one of the fire boats brought to put in. My grandfather was a New York City uh, Fire uh, Department Battalion Chief, and he was able to get us uh, for a, a ride around New York City Harbor on the firefighter. It was finally, as I said, retired in 2010. Uh, it is now a museum ship out in Greenport, Long Island, and it's uh, maintained by volunteers. They uh, just take it uh, basically every couple of years over to Connecticut to a shipyard. Spent this past winter over there uh, because uh, uh, the uh, COVID situation being down, but they've taken it over and it's very lovingly restored. Uh, they have gone to tremendous effort on things like that searchlight and foghorn up in the front of the ship up on the top to find them after they came out of service so they were removed over years. As you can imagine, ship that stays in service for 70 years gets modernized, but they've done their most to put it back to this uh, 1938 configuration. 
So if you're out on Greenport, uh, Long Island, uh, go out there and, and visit it. It's a, a great ship to see. This is a destroyer. This is the USS Goff, larger than a destroyer escort. And these were what they called four stackers. You could see a bunch of the, uh, some of the ships had two stacks, three or four. Well, this one is a four stacker. The four stackers were uh, not the best ships in the United States Navy. Um, they were uh, some of bad design considerations, but they really became a big thing because uh, President Roosevelt gave a lot of them to the British Navy under Lend-Lease. Uh, we were prohibited by law from uh, giving direct assistance to the British Navy, so we couldn't sell them a ship, but we could lend them a ship that we hoped we never got back. And in exchange, the British couldn't pay us for the lease, but they could lend us things like Navy bases in the Azores and other places that we wanted to have strategic places to start positioning our Navy. So the Goff did not go over to uh, lend lease. Uh, a number of the other ships in its class did. Uh, it was uh, at the end of World War II, basically the day World War II ended, this uh, ship and others of its uh, ilk were all decommissioned. It was scrapped in 1945. Again, they had horrible, horrible seafaring characteristics, but it was a, a terrible ship is better than no ship and the British Navy was absolutely wonderfully glad to, to get them. Just a view here are some of the ships out visiting uh, out in the harbor. You can see battleship off on the left, a uh, couple cruisers there, uh, destroyers, all sorts of things. And people out on their pleasure boats go out and see them or people could just wander around the parkways drive up and take a look at the, uh, the naval might sitting out there uh, visiting. The crews, of course, came at the town. And uh, if you remember movies like uh, On the Town, one of my all-time favorites with Gene Kelly, they would come in, they'd get 24-hour leave. And a lot of these guys were very glad to be in New York because they got to come and see the, uh, the New York World's Fair. Now, this is an interesting, again, to make research uh, really tough. If you go to look for this one, the SS Boteri, you will not find it because this is actually the MS Batori. So it's not an SS, it's an MS, a motor ship. It's B-A-T-O-R-Y. He kind of uh, got, got a little dyslexic there. So this was a Polish liner. It started service in 1936 and uh, uh, basically doing a lot of service between, again, the United States and uh, uh, Europe for uh, uh, passenger service. It was seized in World War II, became a troop ship, and it was given back to Poland and returned into cruise ship service. But in 1951, it got into a bunch of political uh, controversy as the Cold War was going on. The United States unions did not want to service ships that were being allied in their minds with anything with the Soviet bloc. So in 1951, it would come into uh, the New York Harbor and the New York uh, longshoremen would refuse to unload it. So they took it out of uh, mid-Atlantic service and put it into other areas down the Caribbean, stuff like that, where it did not have to come to the U.S. waters, uh, and it was eventually scrapped in 1971. For those not from New York and looking at the uh, hills behind it, those are the uh, Palisades along the Hudson River. If you've heard, uh, if you remember from the past talk, Palisade Amusement Park up at the top of uh, those. Just a view of the Battery Park area and skyline, 1939. That round building down below was a fort. Uh, it was uh, uh, served for a number of years as that. It also used, it was served as a, a point of embarkation for immigrants coming into the uh, country. And it also served for a uh, number of years as New York's premier aquarium, all built in that building. So this whole area has changed tremendously. As you can imagine, the skyline has uh, drastically changed. And you do not see all these fleets of tugboats uh, puffing their way around. But the old fort is still there, and uh, you can go and visit it. No longer the aquarium that got moved out to uh, Coney Island. Brooklyn Bridge, uh, I'm sorry, the Washington Bridge. I'm thinking about something else with Brooklyn in a second. And the building up behind it, I will just uh, zoom in on that a little. Kind of interesting looking building. And you can see up on it, it says Ben Marsden's uh, Casino, uh, Riviera. This was a very uh, popular uh, casino that was built up there in nightclub and it lasted from 1931 to 1953. And it hosted very, very well-known uh, band performers. Uh, and it was a big, big spot for the elite of New York to go. It was just across the, uh, the uh, George Washington Bridge, so it was really easy to get to. 
Unfortunately, it was right in the path of the planned Palisades Interstate Parkway. So in 1953, they seized it. Uh, they ended up a court battle having to pay Ben what uh, they thought it was worth. And I think he got about $800,000, which was pretty good money in 1953. But there is no side of it, uh, a side of it left anymore. It's just under the, uh, the, the concrete of the, the uh, Palisades Parkway. Again, just another view going through. I could not decipher the name of the ship going through here. Some of them are just blurry enough that you can't uh, get the uh, information out of them. But we'll jump back out of here. So that's 1939. And we're going to take a look. Uh, we're going to be moving around here. We're going to hop up to 1960. And again, here's uh, the SS uh, United States. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. Is this the United States? No, this is a Queen Mary. Uh, uh, I was wrong here. The, uh, the color of the funnels threw me off here. Here is the uh, SS America. The uh, America was uh, another one of the liners done uh, for the United States line. And uh, this was done by a fellow who uh, became very, very famous for designing ships. And uh, Francis, uh, I'm going to make sure I get his name right here. Uh, Franz, uh, SS America. I'm going to be looking at my notes here. One second. Yes, William Francis Gibbs. I want to make sure I got his name right. He's the same fellow that later became famous for designing the uh, SS United States. This was built in 1939, and it's interesting because Gibbs designed the outside of the ship, but a lot of women designers were brought in to design the interior, which was very unusual. Shipbuilding was very much a male-dominated industry, but the United States line said, hey, you know, uh, if we have women that like to sail on the ships too, that might make it easier to you know, convince them to get their husband to go on our ship instead of another ship. So uh, women designers and architects uh, did their best on it. This one did burn coal uh, and uh, uh, fuel oil. I can't remember if it was coal or fuel oil when this particular one was launched, but they did find that, that they had to raise the funnels on this one uh, because they went for low funnels, uh, because it's less wind resistance, less wind resistance means a faster ship, so you can win the coveted blue ribbon. Well, in this particular one, the low funnels drop soot all over the ship, and uh, they had to raise it back up. So there were certain people that complained uh, that the uh, uh, look of the ship was ruined by these giant funnels, but it was a necessary thing that they had to, to do with it. It was used as a troop ship from 1941 to 1946. Uh, almost every liner at that point in time uh, was to turn into a cruise ship because obviously people were not cruising between here and uh, in Europe. Uh, it was sold in 1964 to the Chandris line out of uh, Greece and it was named the Australis. And it had a, a big uh, service of going back and forth on their uh, uh, service for years. Uh, but it finally wore out and they uh, decided they were going to scrap it and they were towing it in 1994 to the shipyard and it broke loose from its tow and it went aground and uh, sat there on the side of uh, the, the shore for many years, broke into two for years. It was uh, a tremendous wreck people and very hard to get to even on land. So people would go out and uh, visit it, take pictures of it, and it's finally succumbed to the uh, uh, elements and uh, is no longer seen. There's a very, very active group on Facebook for the, uh, the Australis years, because a lot of people made their immigration and their first arrival over on Australia on this ship. Uh, and it's uh, very, very popular with people in the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, on, on Facebook with that. Again, sometimes I can pick out the names of some of these ships. Uh, others are just stuck over here on the side. What's interesting on this one, if you look in the ship in the site, all the derricks, all the cranes are on it, because a lot of these ships would go into ports that did not have massive port facilities, and they would have to lift everything on and off the ship itself. So if, the, uh, if they got down to some island and the island didn't have a crane, well, the ship had to take it on and off. That all changed in later years when they went to container ships, and uh, they would preload everything onto a giant box as we see all the time these days, you know, containers on trains or passing us on the freeway. But back at this point in time, this is what Joey Vinto's dad did. All of the stuff had to be put into a basket, lifted up by a, a crane, put into the, the ship and, and went off and sailed. So the whole look of ships have changed from the, that point in time. Just all the piers that are gone out that way. 
ferries, again, before the Verrazano Narrow Bridge and other things, there were ferries all over the place. Some of them were owned by the city. They were actually privately owned uh, ferry lines. We'll see one of those coming up in a, a few moments. Kind of hop out of 1960, and we're gonna go and take a look at one of those old ferries. This picture is taking a little while to load. These are kind of large uh, pictures. I did not get to shrink down. So we're back in the, the 1930s and we are aboard the Cornelius G. Kolf, K-O-L-F-F. -F. And this was one of the last steam powered ferries uh, in service on St the Staten Island run. This one that we're looking at was a Marine and Aviation uh, Department ferry that was run by the city of New York. The Gulf that we're on right now, the Gulf rather, was a privately owned ship that would uh, get you back and forth to Staten Island. Um, it was interesting that the, the Gulf, I keep kind of trying to call it the Gulf because there's another ship uh, with that name. The Gulf was uh, put in the service uh, and uh, sailed for many years as a private company. But then when you open up the uh, Verrazano Narrows Bridge, you really don't need as many ferries to get you back and forth anymore. Unknown ship going through the, the harbor here. Uh, again, used to be absolutely full of them. So the, the Gulf became a... Uh, uh, prison ship. Uh, back here we're passing uh, Governor's Island. You can see the ice building up in the harbor. Obviously the uh, uh, skyline of New York has changed tremendously. But the Gulf became a prison ship and was moved out to Rikers Island when Rikers Island needed uh, extra space. Uh, it was put out there and uh, served out there for a number of years. Uh, in 2004 it was retired as a prison barge and it was moved over to Staten Island. And the last I was able to research, it was uh, out uh, still at Staten Island, rotting away out there. Interesting view if you know New York, because there's no Verrazano Narrows Bridge crossing over. That's right where you would see it today with the uh, mainland on the left and uh, Staten Island off to uh, the right. And a view of, again, mentioned uh, two weeks ago, there were all sorts of ships that would just be tied up laying out in the harbor, barges waiting to be unloaded, all sorts of uh, things out there, other ships just uh, cruising around. So we're gonna leave the, the call. Hey, I got it right, got the name right that time. And we're gonna go take a look at one of the premier cruise ships of all time. And that of course is the Queen Mary. Uh, Queen Mary was a, a major ship uh, one of the, uh, the, the best ships of all time and uh, certainly one of the fastest. Queen Mary uh, was built uh, to uh, basically take advantage of all the people that were going across the, uh, uh, the, the Atlantic and it was uh, built for speed, became so fast that during World War II, it could outrun its destroyer escorts. So it became known as the Grey Ghost or the Galloping Ghost and it would race across the ocean without uh, escorts uh, on convoy duty, carrying a tremendous number of uh, uh, sailors and soldiers uh, off to war. Uh, Hitler was absolutely determined to uh, get this ship, uh, gave a, a special prize that he announced that if any U-boat commander could bring this thing down, he was going to be rich beyond his dreams, and they were never able to, uh, to do it. The ship started with a little bit of controversy, though, because it started, I think it was called something like hull number 552. They were building it, and uh, nobody knew what it was going to be named. And finally, the Canard Line went out to the king, and they said, uh, we, we'd like to uh, name this ship with your permission after uh, England's uh, greatest queen. And they were thinking Queen Victoria. And the queen said, oh yes, my wife, Queen Mary will be absolutely honored. So all of a sudden the Queen Victoria was now the Queen Mary uh, because you don't go back and tell his, uh, the king that his wife was not the greatest queen that ever lived. So the uh, Queen Mary served in tremendous service, uh, very, very popular. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth, the first one was built uh, using a lot of the design techniques that they learned on this. In uh, 1952, uh, it, it held the Blue Ribbon, band, matter of fact, it got it in 1938 and it held it until 1952, the longest period of time any ship had held it up until that point in time. Uh, it was just absolutely a, 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 a speed demon. In 1967, it had made its 1,000th uh, transatlantic crossing, and the Canard Line decided that at that point it was time to retire it. You can imagine it had seen a lot of use, a lot of wear and tear. 
So uh, luckily for us that left ships was not scrapped as most were. It was not lost under tow as to so many were. It was sold to the city of Long Beach in uh, 1967 and brought out here. And it was interesting as part of the sale to the city of Long Beach, Kennard was very worried that what if somebody took this ship and put it back into service and uh, competed against the other ships because a lot of people might want to ride on the original Queen Mary. So as part of the sale to the uh, city of Long Beach, matter of fact, I can still go through some of these other pictures I'm talking about. They had to remove all the boilers and they took out all the engine rooms but one and a lot of the other equipment. So while it sits out in Long Beach today, and unfortunately today it's in bad shape, it has not been out of uh, the water for an overhaul in many, many years. Excuse me, and they were worried that the uh, hull may get breached by rust and that sort of thing. And uh, it was operated by several other um, uh, vendors that did not take care of it. It was op actually operated by Disney for a number of years. Uh, the ship had been, uh, again, brought to Long Beach, actually owned by the city of Long Beach, but was leased out to a number of uh, other vendors. These are all views of the Queen Mary back in 1939. Uh, the uh, Rather Corporation took a lease on the Queen Mary and operated it as a hotel. So when Disney bought the uh, uh, Rather Corporation because they wanted to get the Disney Hotel, they ended up with the lease to the Queen Mary. Now they had done some things and we'll see some pictures of it later on. They built a fake British village alongside the Queen Mary. Carol and I went out to that about the week or so it opened and uh, they, they had all sorts of pomps and circumstances for that. But uh, Disney was hoping to build a major development around the Queen Mary called Disney Seas. Uh, and the city of Long Beach did not come up with the money that they wanted and they ended up uh, uh, scrapping that particular project. And Disney Seas uh, ended up being built in Tokyo. I got a real kick out of this picture. We can get our fresh cut, uh, real pure, hand, uh, handmade ice cream sandwiches for only five cents. So he's, uh, he's doing good business there. You better stop. If you don't stop at the sign, you're going to be in the harbor. And we're setting out to sea here. Again, tremendous ship uh, on it. So uh, absolutely just wonderful. This is the Isle de France, another uh, famous ship. Again, all these ships would come into New York. They would get turned around as fast as possible. It was just like a airliner sitting at the, uh, um, you know, the gate. It's not making money. The ships would go back and forth. So they would have all the provisions lined up, ready to go. They'd lift them up on the ship. The Isle of France was viewed as a particularly luxurious ship. Uh, the French were always trying to out-style the, the British. The British had the speed. The French were trying to go for uh, the luxury uh, aspect of it. And that's why things like the Normandy became such a popular thing. It was built in 1927. And in World War II, it became a prison ship. The uh, Germans had it and they weren't gonna go sail it anywhere. And the Germans didn't have the particular need for a troop ship that uh, the uh, allies did, but they had a need for, where are you gonna stick all the prisoners of war? So they stuck them out on, on the, uh, the France. Uh, after uh, World War II, it was returned to service. And uh, j just looking at the ship before I go to the next picture again, there's a movie, if you're a fan of uh, cruise ships, you gotta see, it's called The Last Voyage with Robert Stack and Dorothy Malone. They wanted to do a ship, a, a movie about an ill-fated cruise ship that was worn out uh, beyond its time and on its last voyage, terrible thing happened, the ship gets, just starts to sink. And they went out of their way to be realistic. They actually went off and they got the Isle, Isle de France. Uh, the French line did not know this was gonna happen. They thought this ship was gonna be scrapped. It was sold to, uh, uh, company was going to, I think there was a Chinese company was going to take it and take it apart. But in between, they uh, gave it to the film company to use for sinking uh, scenes. And they actually would do things like they would sink the ship, they'd flood the front of the ship and bring it way down into the water. So the, the propellers are coming up out of the water in the background, uh, the bows going down under the water, actually submerging it. They would then pump the water back out, write the ship back up, do another take, that sort of thing. There's a scene in the movie where uh, the ship is going down and the water is exploding into the windows that you can see along the side of the ship. They actually put people inside the real ship's dining room 
and they brought fire boats outside and blasted them with as much water as the fire boats could pump, pump out, blew out the windows, flooded the room, and uh, it just amazing uh, uh, scenes. Uh, the, uh, the French company then made a, a particular thing that any time they ever sold any of their ships, they could not be used in movies. But if you do get a chance to see it, The Last Voyage, it's a tremendous view of a uh, transatlantic liner on its uh, last legs. We saw this one the other day, the uh, ferry boats, and just some of the other ships that were going around uh, in, in particular one. This is the SS New York. Uh, despite it sounding like a, a good, solid United States type name, it is not a uh, uh, United States ship. It was a, a, a German ship. And again, used for uh, uh, transport between the, uh, the US and the European market. And just seeing if I have any notes of interesting on the SS New York. Nothing in particular that I see that I wrote down here. I got a lot on the Battleship New York, but uh, so again, they would paint their uh, funnels and distinctive uh, marks so that everybody could see the pride of their ships coming in. A lot of these, uh, again, tankers and uh, uh, coal ships, you can see all the coal they're dumping off to the side here. Fishing ships, I mentioned two weeks ago, they came into New York and still were uh, very, very popular going in and out of uh, the area, bringing their, their fresh crops of uh, or catches their ships in. Here's the motor vessel Georgic, uh, another one with low funnels. Again, depending on what you're burning, you can have a whole different thing what you're, you're doing in terms of the, uh, uh, the type of fuel that you're, you're burning makes a big difference on the line of your ship. Not a particularly fast ship, but uh, did do well in uh, service for a number of years. Here's the Europa going out, uh, uh, passing in by the Statue of Liberty. I did have some notes on the Europa. Uh, let me pull that up here. Europa, where did you go, Europa? It was actually built as a, I don't know where I put those. I'll have to find, it was actually built as a different ship and uh, renamed the Europa. And uh, again, a lot of these went through all sorts of things for, um, War prizes after the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the Germans lost the war, a lot of their ships were given away, renamed, put into service in uh, other particular uh, areas. The Isle of France sailing out to sea, more uh, fishing boats. The Georgic again. If there's anything else in here that we haven't seen, fishing ships, they, they go on after a while. So let me skip out of this one. Again, we're still, all these were back in uh, 1939. So we're going to take a look at some other ocean liners. In this particular one, this is what you'd see if you were sailing out to sea. Everybody could go on those long piers that stood out into the uh, uh, Hudson River. And uh, my picture, but parents have pictures of us kids all there frantically waving. We in turn had pictures of them uh, frantically waving and everybody uh, went off on their way. But uh, everybody's coming out finery. The people, you can see the ladies even wearing white gloves, which probably didn't stay white very long along the, uh, uh, the, the waterfront back in that period of time. But you could go up on the, uh, the back of the things, wave and get a big thing. And it was a, a big issue. My grandparents would bring us out there. We'd wave goodbye to the folks and, and we'd, uh, we'd see them a week later and they'd have a, a great time doing it. Here's the Liberté uh, out, uh, not being tossed from side to side for a change, but getting ready to go out. Tugboat now is pushing the ship out to uh, uh, end to the harbor. One last uh, look as we go out, all the freighters and everything out there. And we're being uh, taken out to sea and off they go. And uh, I guess they wanted to make sure that they knew if anything went wrong, they had the lifeboats to get themselves off. I don't think I'd like to spend a lot of time in one of these lifeboats, but it's probably better than, uh, than nothing. And again, back then, uh, as I mentioned, derricks, uh, all these ships had these massive cranes on board. They could lift cars, put them down in the hold. And that's what some of the rich would do is that when you went over to Europe, you would bring your uh, own personal limo in that. And we're heading out and finally into the ocean, the Ambrose Lightship out, anchored out there. I think the Ambrose is now at the uh, seaport in uh, New York and uh, visible. 
I'm going to take another look going back out, back on the, uh, the stern. The uh, folks are putting the uh, uh, flag up. And if we zoom in a little here, we will see that we are on the SS Mauritania out of Liverpool. Again, some of these ships served for many, many years. Most of them ended up getting scratched, uh, scrapped over time. And sometimes they had multiple uh, ships would have the same name. So there were multiple Queen Elizabeths over the year, multiple Mauritanias and that. Uh, but uh, great fittings. I worked at Pinewood Studios over in uh, England. Uh, Mauritania got scrapped. They used a lot of the uh, wood fittings and that over in uh, the boardroom and uh, very, uh, very ornate uh, sort of thing. The swimming pools have definitely changed uh, uh, the, the sort of style that they have over the year. First of all, they're very, very small. Uh, and you can see they have all this uh, cargo rope overhead. That's to keep people from going in it during the periods of time they didn't want people in it because the water would slosh uh, very, very much from side to side. You can imagine when you saw the pictures of the Liberty, how it was going back and forth. If you were in the pool, it would be uh, quite a, a deal. And some ships got to be famous because they had not one but two pools on board. And then, oh my goodness, some ships started having out, uh, indoor pools on board. But things have changed so much. Uh, with You can see you had to walk these narrow little passageways because they had to have all the holds and everything that you could lift everything in and out of these cranes. Again, passenger service was one thing, cargo service was another, mail service. Uh, all these ships had multiple functions. Today, the, the cruise ships just carry people. You know, they don't carry any of this cargo or anything back and forth. <coughs> Excuse me. People well dressed for their time. They're coming into the harbor. The Queen Mary is sitting at one of the docks, waiting to get ready on its cruise to go back out. Still looking in pretty spiffy shape here. And we'll go back to one more group of them in this particular era. So the U.S., uh, not the USS Constitution, which was a warship, the SS uh, Constitution, another cruise liner. This one shows up in all sorts of Hollywood uh, productions and movies. This one was built in 1951, lasted until 1955. I'm sorry, 1995. But it shows up in all sorts of movies. If you watch I Love Lucy and she uh, misses the ship and has to be brought out by helicopter to get out to the ship, She's uh, joining the USS, uh, I keep saying USS, sorry, the SS Constitution. Uh, the movie Affair to Remember with uh, uh, Cary Grant, I think it's uh, uh, Deborah Kerr. Uh, the ship they sail over and they promise to meet later, years later, they're on the SS Constitution. And they shot most of an episode of Magnum PI on, on this particular ship. My parents sailed on it, particularly liked it, said it was a very nice ship. And it was not as rocking and rolling as some of the others that uh, they remembered. Uh, in 1997, it was being towed for scrapping. And what do we think happened to it? It sunk. So down there at the bottom with uh, many, many others. The United States back in a happier period of time. The large mast up here where my mouse is moving up and down is where the crow's nest would go. You can see radar up at the top, but they still had a person up there in the crow's nest keeping an eye on things to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, that they didn't have any problems with the radar went out. After the Andrea Doria had its terrible uh, collision and sunk uh, after it collided with the Stockholm, they made sure that uh, even though if you had radar, you had to man the crow's nest at all periods of uh, time. So the United States, by the way, uh, started service in 1952, and it was the largest uh, steamship or the largest ocean liner built in the United States. Uh, it was absolutely the fastest liner. Uh, it was done with a revolutionary uh, design that was uh, actually classified by the United States military for years, both the hull design and the design of its uh, propellers. It was designed to be built uh, as a liner, but it could also be converted into a cruise ship, I'm sorry, a troop ship in a very, very fast uh, period of time. It was never used as a cruise uh, troop ship. Uh, but it has gone through a, a very uh, sad uh, period after that. I'll, matter of fact, come up with a picture of that in just a second. Uh, after it, it basically was retired in uh, 1969, uh, at this point in time, let me just jump down to a picture of it. It was retired in 1969 as cruise ships were uh, coming out of favor, uh, uh, or liners were coming out of favor, cruise ships were coming in more. Uh, and it was 
basically held up for years. It was down in uh, Virginia for a number of years. It was sold to uh, a, an outfit that was going to redo it for the, the cruise line, and uh, it was taken over to Turkey, totally gutted. And then, uh, it, so the ship has next to nothing left inside of it, other than its, phys, its engines and that are still there. Uh, this picture was taken in uh, 2010. It's been sitting in the city of Philadelphia since 1996, uh, and they keep trying to find some use for it. Uh, it's kind of interesting, while the engines are still there, they're so uh, it would be so uneconomical to uh, operate them today. They would, they would probably have to take out all the steam engines and turn it into a turbine ship. The in inside is absolutely uh, vacant. Uh, all the interiors were ripped out because it was full of asbestos. A lot of these liners were retired because uh, new laws came in place. The United States didn't want cruise liners burning and they also had to do stuff about asbestos. So a lot of the companies just decided to scrap the ships rather than modernize them. Um, the, the contents were sold off at uh, auction, uh, all the pots and pans and dishes and deck chairs and everything. My dad was absolutely in love with the SS United States. Uh, he and my mom had been on it. So Carol and I went to a preview of the auction when they were out here uh, showing stuff out in LA. And I bought a, a box or two boxes of uh, goodies from the SS United States ashtrays, keys to rooms, and that sort of thing. But my dad, for his final year, is his prized blanket on his bed was a blanket from the, uh, the deck chairs of the SS United States. And we, st we still have that, that blanket. So it's nice to know that the ship is still there. I pray to God that somehow one of the many, many owners does something with it. It's been announced it was going to be a cruise ship. And I, I think it was Celebrity Cruises or Premier. A number of the cruise lines have bought it. Princess Cruises bought it for a while. They didn't have it. It's owned by a nonprofit conservancy down in Philadelphia, but it costs about $10,000 a month just to rent the space at the dock and to keep the, uh, the, the guards on the, you know, the ship and to deal with some leaks and other odds and ends as the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the folks are, it's just, it's a real shame to see the thing sitting here in, in such a, uh, a mess. Uh, let's see. Oh, quick ones more. Uh, we're aboard the Isle de France, again, the one that was uh, used in the movie. Uh, basically, back then, you would put a, a, a promenade deck out there. You'd sit in your, uh, your chairs and, and just watch the, uh, the world go by, going out past the, uh, the Statue of Liberty. And everybody's back now. And they've gotten to France. They've gotten off, and they're going to go see, uh, see France. I'm just trying to remember where I put some of these that I did want to show. Um, OK, we're going to jump to 1960. Just some more pictures of some other ships. Ferry boat service. Again, if you're in New York, you know that you can go out to Staten Island and take the Staten Island ferry, a free ride out there, and it's a great uh, do it way to do it. Uh, older ferry here, uh, going back and forth. A lot of these ferries, uh, I can remember going out to Staten Island. We generally would take this one and would go from Brooklyn out to Staten Island because we lived in Brooklyn, so it was the most convenient way to do it. And you'd have to line up forever, and all the streets would be clogged up, and you drive out your car out there, get out to Staten Island. It was great fun to do it, and uh, ride back again. You know, the poor man's holiday. My parents could not afford to take us on a cruise, but they could afford to take us to Staten Island. Being on a, I love being on a ship. These went out of business the week after the Verrazano Narrows uh, Bridge opened up, and you no longer needed uh, ferries to get out there. Some of the the ferry, uh, the tugboats. Leonardo da Vinci, uh, the Italians uh, were also very much into stylish ships, just like the French did. So they built uh, quite a few of the liners and uh, they had a very nice transatlantic service for a number of years. Uh, my folks, I don't know if they ever cruised in the, the da Vinci. I do know that they went to a dinner aboard it, but I don't know if they, I don't know who he is, it's not me. But uh, my, my folks were very uh, uh, pleased with the, uh, the service that they went on onto the ship and said it was very classy. And again, I, I don't know, I, I've been going through their old pictures, but I don't think I found any that they, uh, they actually sailed on it. Again, the Mauritania, mentioned it earlier, we saw the pictures of it cruising over there. And I've got some, just taking a look at time, some of these ships, again, uh, just find pictures my grandparents actually took here. One second. 
Another well, ship, the Queen of Bermuda was a ship that went back and forth uh, between uh, the US and, and Bermuda for quite a few years. It was built in 1933. And it uh, basically first started with about 90% of it was first class service. This is the pictures taken by my uh, grandmother. Uh, they're on the last cruise of the Queen of Bermuda, which uh, uh, was in 1996, November of uh, 19, uh, not sorry, November 1966. So, um, it was used as a troop ship um, during the war after it came out and it was uh, used for all first class service. Uh, this was a double exposure as they're going out past the, uh, the French line. Uh, but it was all first class uh, travel. My parents went to Bermuda quite a few times, I think at least three times aboard the, uh, on the Queen of Bermuda. And uh, the, uh, my grandparents went on this, the last cruise out. My parents particularly liked it because and that's my grandmother. They liked it because my dad didn't get a tremendous amount of vacation. And if you took a transatlantic cruise, it was a week over to get there and a week to come back. There was his vacation. Bermuda, as we did with the Mal Siege, you'd go over, stay for a couple of days, sail back, and do it all in a week. So uh, my grandparents had been on it a couple of times with my folks. You can see very, uh, it's sort of like our trip, Tom, right? <laughs> not, not the nicest weather going over there. And they finally got over to uh, the, uh, Bermuda. But this is the sort of thing that they really liked. Uh, they could dress up in their mink stole. My uh, grandfather, he was the one that was the uh, New York City Battalion Chief, put in their tuxedos and go to the, their, their dinners. And they, they really enjoyed it. My parents enjoyed it too. Uh, my folks were not very uh, uh, big socialites or anything, but they really got a kick out of going on the cruise ships. And a matter of fact, I can find something there. Yeah, we're going to join my parents now on a cruise to the Bahamas in 1969 on a ship called the Oceanic. The Oceanic was built in 1963, and it did. A, there's my mom sitting on the the far left, and some of their their good friends. My parents definitely like to party on the ships, and uh, we have quite a few pictures of them having, uh, shall we say, cocktails and libations aboard the the ships. Uh, but the Oceanic was built in 1963, and it, it was right at the end of the uh, the cruise, uh, the transatlantic cruise time. So it did a few uh, transatlantic runs, but then mostly was uh, sent down into the uh, Caribbean run to go uh, back between the various islands over there. Uh, and my parents sailed on a number of times. That's my dad, uh, the the travel agent, and uh, here's uh, looking at the ship as it's getting ready to sail. So. This would have been a picture I took as they sailed off because we didn't get to go. So they, off they go. Tug pushing it out into the uh, ocean or into the river and uh, then out to the ocean. And this again, they, they really liked it. And my folks really enjoyed it. Uh, again, they, my dad worked real hard. This is their uh, good friends, uh, the Argenzios. And they would take these cruises and uh, they ended up taking my brothers in later years on one or two of them. But uh, I was always so glad that they were able to do this and relax and just get away. And they really enjoyed their, their time out there. Now, some of these ships uh, could dock at uh, the ports, but some of them were too big. So you need to have tenders that would come alongside. You'd get on, uh, leave the ship out in the harbor. Here's my dad uh, looking real natty in his uh, shorts and Joe Argenzio getting off to the shore. And my mom enjoying her, her time aboard it. And this is what they loved, going aboard for the, the meals, the big buffets. And things haven't changed that much from cruise ships today. You know, everybody goes off, overeats, and, uh, you know, comes back much heavier than that they uh, went off on the ships. Matter of fact, our daughter is taking two or maybe three cruises this year. And uh, my dad looking very natty there. So my daughter has got herself an uh, exercise bike, and she's uh, trying to keep in uh, shape in between cruises. My mom with her ever-present cigarette in hand going out for a night on, uh, on a ship. And again, different. Uh, uh, Carol and I, when we travel, we don't travel with tuxedos or ball gowns or anything like that. We're, we're not into that sort of thing. Oh, flaming desserts. They were having a great time. And again, I was really glad I was able to inherit so many of my folks' pictures. We'll finish, I think there's more of their crews, but we'll stop. Just had a couple others real quick before we end up. The Queen Mary, as I mentioned, is uh, out here in uh, LA and it's been uh, for a number of years. 
but we're going to take a, a quick look at uh, this. Some of these pictures are uh, not uh, yet uh, restored, so I'm going to apologize in advance for some of the colors in that. But these were taken on July 1st, 1976. The Queen Mary, because it was sold uh, intact, it still had all the uh, furnishings of it, like unlike so many of the others that were sold off and then scrapped. So you still had the original uh, uh, tables and chairs and bed linings and everything else that was uh, used in it. And a lot of these became very popular to go and stay in the, uh, the hotel. Now, if you do look at the uh, hotel rooms, they're very, very small because the cabins of those ships were very, very small. So uh, it became more of a thing to say, I'm staying on the Queen Mary because it's the Queen Mary, not because it was a particularly luxurious hotel. Uh, they took a lot of the space where they emptied out the engine rooms, sections like this where the holds were, and there's displays about how the ship operates. You can see uh, the spare anchor. Uh, and again, they did have a spare anchor because if you lost your original anchor, you know, what did you do? Well, they had a spare anchor and spare propellers for these things. Massive models of some of the ships in their seaport uh, museum. What's really nice is the Queen Mary is now closed because of the pandemic. They don't know if it's going to, uh, matter of fact, they serve, uh, uh, did uh, church ceremonies. They had their own vestments and everything. It's been closed since the pandemic, hoping to hell to get it reopened. But everything that was aboard the ship when they sold it, they ended up with all of the table service and everything else that was uh, out there and, and on board. Sorry, some of the, uh, they had uh, also things for the Jewish services. You could go in, you could go and visit the ship's dentist or the ship's doctor and get your things taken care of there. A tribute to its time on World War II, uh, again, when it was the fastest cruise ship out there, a troop ship that they also needed to make sure if they were attacked that they could defend themselves. One engine room left intact, but no boilers to actually power the uh, uh, engine. So you can go down into the, the space and see how it all was, uh, was particularly done. And this is what the gutted areas look like. You wander through, and this used to be all giant massive machinery and everything else, which was all taken out. When they took it out, by the way, they had to take the funnels off the ship and cut a hole through the top deck to lift all the engines out. And they found out the funnels had totally rusted and rotted away. So they, uh, the ones on the ship today are uh, replicas. Well, let me just go into uh, real quick, just a number of other random ships. Fleet Week, again, you would bring in things like the uh, uh, aircraft carrier. I was not able to pick the, the name of this particular one. But my uh, father's father loved taking us down to uh, Fleet Week. And it was the first time I had ever been on a Navy ship and uh, went on board a submarine and uh, never thought I would end up becoming a submarine designer. But we loved Fleet Week. You'd go down and, and they'd have destroyers and aircraft carriers and submarines and uh, you know uh, minesweepers and everything. It was just, uh, just great fun to, to go on. There's the Mauritania over at the Canard Line Pier. Uh, again, that was the building I worked in for New York Telephone over on the right. I mentioned two weeks ago how we would walk down and visit all these cruise ships uh, uh, during our lunch hours. Great fun. Here's my New York World's Fair tie-in. This is the aquafoil service that ran between New York and uh, the World's Fair site. I believe it's the only time that New York has had aquafoil service. Uh, they, they have all sorts of fast ferries and everything. But the aquafoil was a, a popular way that you could get out there. But as everybody knows, aquafoils can bounce like hell. So it was a, a real teeth jarring, uh, knock out your filling rides on many particular days going out. You had all sorts of ships. Uh, my father's company ended up moving most of their ships over to Brooklyn. This was a, a, line, a freighter from a, a company called Netamar, which used to be a, comp a competitor of dad's and then imploded. And this was their last ship. Got a picture of that. Aircraft carrier, the Brooklyn Navy Yard was very busy up until the uh, uh, 60s. I'm, I forget exactly what year, 60s, early 70s, it was finally decommissioned. But uh, here they're uh, rebuilding one of the aircraft carriers. You can see a mass of other ships off to the right, uh, giant cranes. And again, this is where the movie In the Town begins. This gives you an idea of what was look, things were looking in the 1960s. Look at all those aircraft carriers all waiting to be scrapped. 
Uh, this was a fellow taking a helicopter ride around the New York uh, area. Uh, but these were all World War II uh, vintage aircraft carriers. They had been brought back uh, put into uh, mothballs. Uh, some of them were reactivated and used for the uh, Korean War, but uh, most of these were all uh, basically taken out and scrapped and, and thrown to the heap. Zoom in this one for a second. I managed to misplace the large uh, size one of this, but these were ferries, very, very popular. The Bell Island up here, uh, I forget the name of the others off the top. I had the Claremont, I forget the one in the back. These would take you up the Hudson River to places like the uh, uh, Bear Mountain, or else just go out to sea and cool off because New York did not have air conditioning. As we all know, it can get hot and humid. So uh, companies would rent these and uh, take these out. If you look up the story of the General Slocum, it shows why they needed to do things to change these ships. They were built out of wood. The General Slocum had a tremendous number of people that were on board for a picnic for the uh, New York Telephone Company. And then General Slocum caught fire and uh, killed a massive number of people, one of the worst seaborne uh, uh, disasters of, of time. Uh, so these ships were very, very popular and they were floating death traps. Luckily, uh, these particular ones did not end up uh, killing folks. You can see here is a, the example uh, built in 1911. Uh, the Claremont uh, went up and down the Catskills, uh, the Hudson River to the Catskills. and you know, all sorts of uh, particular different history of, of these things. So Bear Mountain Cruises were real big in the uh, uh, 50s and 60s. Um, high school classes would take trips up there. By the time I got to uh, high school in 69, the ships have been retired, so we ended up going by bus. <clears throat> Constitution, another view of the ship. The Queen Mary. I do have one. Of, oh, I, I, somewhere I had, I, I have to just find if I, Bear with me just one second. Another ship, I, I just want to come over the picture here. See if I can find it real quick. I had some pictures of uh, ships in the Hudson River. I just wanted to share with you real quick. Oh, okay, real quick here. This was the sort of uh, end to a lot of ships. This is the Hudson River, and this was the Liberty ships that were uh, left from World War II, and they uh, didn't know what to do with them after the war. They built so many of these things. They would build, turning these ships out in about a month's time, start to finish, build an entire cargo ship, out you go, and now we don't need all these. So you ended up with tremendous ghost fleets of these. This is in the Hudson River. There was another uh, giant set of them out here in uh, uh, California. Uh, th uh, there was another giant, some of these down in Virginia. There, they had all these ghost fleets were out there. Out of all these ships, I think three, two for sure, maybe three has survived. Uh, the Jeremy, uh, Brian, and uh, oh, God, I'm not sure remember what the name of the other one is. But the, they, they now are owned by uh, pet, uh, you know um, civilian groups that can serve them and everything. But uh, it was a big thing for people to go up and uh, you know see all these ships if you're on your way up to Bear uh, uh, Bear Mountain. That this was actually taken by a uh, passenger aboard a train on its way up to uh, uh, going up to the uh, Albany area. So I about run out of time. I could bore you with yet more and more ships and old ships and uh, you know uh, what you call it uh, rusty ships and new ships. But there you go. So. Tom, how many of those, did you sail in any of the ones we saw today? You're muted, Tom, here. Let me, uh, I don't... there you go. No, there we go. Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't think any of, the, of those I was on. Uh, not that I can read. Uh, I think we didn't begin till, as as I said, in the in the mid seventies, and a lot of those, as as you mentioned, were gone by then. Yeah, there's uh, uh, how many have changed? Oh, I was just looking at my notes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Before I forgot, the SS Oceanic uh, for the Disney fans would be uh, familiar because it was uh, became the big red boat in two thousand and was used oh, for yeah. Disney cruises. And yeah, uh, yeah. that was scrapped in 2012. Yeah. The uh, SS Bremen we saw was built as the SS Pasteur in, in France in 38, seized as a, a 
troop ship and was again super fast, so it, it went without escorts. Stayed a troop ship until 1957, uh, made its last Atlanta cruise in 71, was used as a hotel uh, ship, and then it was uh, sold for scrap in 1980. And do we want to guess what happened to it? <laughs> it's on, under tow. <laughs> uh, you were never, Tom, were you ever on the original Queen Elizabeth? No, I was not. Um, I believe one chance to, to visit it when it was in the New York, and I, I wasn't able to, uh, to do that, so I nev never was, was on that one, no. Okay, I know you love the QE2. The original Queen Elizabeth uh, was built as an ocean liner, but the, uh, did not get to be an ocean liner for many, many years because World War II got in the way. So it started as a, a cruise ship, and it was interesting. It was the largest uh, cruise ship built up to that point in time, and it went immediately into service as a, a, a troop ship. It was also the largest ship ever built uh, with rivets by tonnage. So, so many ships now are welded together, and some of the ships, I was actually looking, like the one that's behind me is the uh, United States. You can see a bunch of rivets in certain parts, but most of it's uh, uh, held together by being welded. But the Queen Elizabeth was, was all bolted together with rivets, and the, it was designed to take some of the flaws, as I mentioned earlier, out of the Queen Mary and put it in the Queen Elizabeth, but didn't get to be a cruise liner until 1946. It turned out it tossed in a turn, so in 1955 they added stabilizers to it because now people were wanting to have some uh, stability for it. It sailed until 1969. It was retired as the QE2 came on board, and then it was uh, turned into a, a university, the CYS University, and it was being outfitted in Hong Kong. And on January 3rd, 1972, it caught fire and it sunk it in Hong fire. Kong Harbor. Yeah, yep. I remember that. Yeah, it was a real disaster. And again, uh, what caused it to sink? Well, it was bought for $3 million. It was insured for $8 million. <laughs> and four or five fires bro uh, broke out simultaneously. Arson was suspected. Yeah. So uh, it, it sat there in Hong Kong Harbor for a number of years. If you want to go see the ends of the Queen Elizabeth, go watch The Man with the Golden Gun, where uh, James Bond is uh, 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 taken out to the wreck of it and find that that's where MI6 has built their headquarters in the sunken ruins of the, uh, the uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth. And finally, in about 1976, they dredged it out and got the, uh, the, rest, uh, the rest of it out. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy Gregory's mentioned the Big Red Boat was once the premier cruise line. Yeah, Premier bought a number of old uh, cruise ships. Uh, they, they had quite a few of them. Yeah, I was uh, on a couple of those. But, yeah. yeah. They had uh, uh, two of the ships from the old home line used to sail out of New York. Yeah, I, I had pictures the Atlantic of and the Homeric. Yeah. They, also had the, they also had the Rotterdam. Yes. Yeah. Because my yes, parents. And we were on, on that after they sold it, it became the Rembrandt. And mm -hmm. it sailed out of Florida for a while. <laughs> but that's the only ship we were ever on that the bathroom had a heated towel rack. <laughs> I don't know why I remember that, but I do. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You know, my parents, parents sailed on the Rotterdam. I had pictures, and again, I ran out of time. They really liked it. Because the yeah. Rotterdam, uh, uh, again, they, they went on a number of cruises. Uh, they went through the Panama Canal on cruises. They went Hawaii on cruises. They did a lot of cruises. They liked the Rotterdam, and the Rotterdam was another one sold to Premier, and they were talking about renaming it to the Big Red Boat 4, I think, and people yeah. started screaming because they had this, uh, you know, history of the Rotterdam. Yeah. So uh, it was uh, part of the Premier cruise lines until the line totally collapsed and went bankrupt in 2000. Mm -hmm. It was seized by the creditors. There was a big talk they were going to scrap it. Luckily, it was uh, saved, and it's now a floating hotel in Rotterdam. So yeah. if you uh, go over to Rotterdam and you want to stay, like here you used to be able to stay on the Queen Mary, now you can go and stay on a classic cruise liner and stay on the Rotterdam over in uh, in Rotterdam. Yeah. And oh, Greg Abbott, you sailed on the Stottendam. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I lost track of how many of the different trips my parents take. Because being travel agents, they had a real good deal. You could go on the ships for the, basically all you paid was the tax. 
Right. So uh, once they retired, uh, they were able to just take cruise after cruise after cruise. And, uh, you know, uh, my mother, as I mentioned, she was a chain smoker for years. When we were cleaning out the house, uh, I think we had a collection of ashtrays of cruise ships from around the world. And uh, <laughs> she, uh, uh, they really enjoyed it. Mom, mom and dad just really had a great time. And Carol and I also met them on uh, you know, different vacations. Uh, you know, uh, there was one time my folks were uh, taking a land cruise and they were uh, in Amsterdam and I was working in um, Germany. I said, Amsterdam's close enough. I'll just pop over to you know, Amsterdam and see the, uh, the folks. And you know, it was uh, great fun that they'd be all around the world. And sometimes my schedule, I'd be around the world and we ended up you know, meeting each other in really weird places. And uh, it's, so being a travel agent was great back then. The internet sort of killed that. So uh, they, it's, yeah. They did a lot of a lot of travel over the years. Anybody else do any cruising? Either on the old ships or the new ships. I and mean, the new ships obviously are totally different with their uh, climbing walls and uh, you know roller coasters and all the rest of it. I I I never cruised on one of the classic ones. I would have absolutely have loved to, but uh, I did get to go aboard the United States. I did get to go aboard the Constitution and you know a, a number of these and just. You know, ooh and ah at it, and uh, they they were a whole different uh, whole different style. Yeah. Was, it, oh. Sorry, Wayne. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, never been on an ocean cruise. The only uh, uh, boats I've been on are the one that goes across Lake Michigan, and also the yeah, ferry out to Catalina. Uh, but uh, I was wondering one thing about your photos, the ones that have the handwritten uh, ship names, what's the source for those? Those are uh, negatives. They're about four by five negatives. And uh, again, the, the guy that did them <clears throat> in the lab went and scratched uh, the names, uh, you know, USS Philadelphia on it. Who I guess with a very fine hand and probably a, a magnifying glass, but yeah, well, those are all original. Was he, a, was he a freelancer, or, or were those uh, newspaper archives, or what? Do not know. If they showed up on eBay, uh, you know, and uh, again uh, went and grabbed them and restored them. They, uh, as you can imagine, from 1939, they've been through how many number of hands, and some of them come through absolutely clean like the one with the guy with the uh, ice cream cart uh you know absolutely next to no damage to that i mean they, they came in a little glycine envelope probably hadn't been out of the envelope in years others have just been thrown in heaps of stuff and take a tremendous amount of uh time to uh uh you know to, to clean up so uh i've actually when you have a, a color negative the computer can do an awful lot for the scanner, and I've mentioned before, you can shine a light infrared beam through it, detect a scratch, and try to uh, uh, computer generate fill in between. Black and white doesn't work because the infrared beam bounces off the silver in the black and white uh, negative and goes back. There's a technique you can do uh, called wet mounting, where you take the negative and you put a, a, a special chemical on it that fills in those scratches and uh, you know takes out a lot of them that way. I have bought and have not yet used a wet mount kit. And I intend to try to go back to some of the scratched black and white negatives to make it easy because uh, the black and white ones, I can spend four hours or more on one picture trying to just get the scratches and dirt and everything off. So I, I have tremendous number of more than I, I've got to uh, get to. The SS France was an ocean liner constructed in France for the French line. But Tom's looking something up for us, it sounds. No, I just... <laughs> Uh, and then uh, Kathy mentioned the uh, U.S. Uh, yeah, the SS France became the uh, SS Norway, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, that again was one of the ones we loved to go down on the SS Norway when it was in uh, port when we were I was working at the phone company. That was just a, a beautiful, beautiful ship, and uh, it it's if you go online and look, there's an absolutely gut wrenching video of it being driven on shore at full speed in India. <clears throat> what they do in a lot of these ships. Is they, they again sell them off and they, they take them to India to scrap them. And they get a special pilot on board and uh, a very small crew, about a half a dozen people, 
they backed the sucker up and they pointed towards the, uh, the, uh, the shore and they just crank up the engines full speed ahead and they ram it right up on the shore trying to get it as far up on the beach as they possibly can. Then they come out and they attach uh, cables to it and winches and they just start dragging it uh, ashore, cutting it apart piece by piece by piece. And uh, in this thing, if you do go look for the video of the uh, uh, SS Norway, whoever this pilot they got, man, the guy knows his job because there's a, a wreckage of a liner to the left, the one of a liner to the right, <clears throat> and he doesn't have any room for, for margin. He just takes this thing in and he's going hell bent for leather and he's only got one chance to do it. And this thing just comes in and it goes right between the other ships up on the beach and, and it you know, comes to a juddering, starring thing and then rings down, done with engines. And then they just, the, the uh, Indians go at it in very unsafe conditions. Uh, matter of fact, they have uh, people out there that constantly do any, if they catch out there with a camera, they'll just beat the crap out of you because they don't want the world to see how bad it is both in terms of their workers and how much pollutants and everything are leached into the ocean and the beaches out there. Uh, but there's uh, all sorts of stuff that, uh, there's a, a guy out here in the uh, California area, it's Westlake Village, I think, goes out and periodically buys a lot of the contents of these ships and sells it. So you, if you want the, the glass panels off of this ship or the bar stools off of that ship, and that's what they do is they go through the ship you know, uh, inch by inch and, you know, cut it apart with blow torches. When they get to this part of the ship, they take all the stuff that's salvageable out. And then on shore, they have all these just giant tents and warehouses of ship parts that you can go buy. And, you know, people like to buy the, uh, uh, the telegraphs and all that sort of stuff. But other people just love to get the, uh, the bar fittings. And, you know, you saw the, the ones I showed real quick from the, uh, uh, Queen Mary, beautiful, you know, etched glass and gold gild and everything. A lot of these ships had it and they still do. But yeah, if you get a chance, go look and see how many of these things. And right now, uh, Kathy's mentioning a lot of ships are being retired, you know, between the pandemic and everything else. The number of ships uh, being sold for scrap metal is, uh, is just up there. And there's some ships that uh, they thought were going to go another 10 years or more and they've just decided it's not worth it uh, to, uh, you know, recondition it after sitting in storage for two years. Off they go to India to get, uh, you know, uh, you know, torn apart. So real, real sad. Well, appreciate folks looking like this. I, I had many, many more of the Queen Mary because when it came uh, here in uh, uh, France, uh, in, into Long Beach, they had uh, every ship out there came and welcomed in with fire boats. The U.S. Navy escorted it in. And then uh, it, Carol and I have been out to visit it uh, a number of times. And uh, I've got one picture I, I want to try to find right now with my dad on the Queen Mary uh, standing next to uh, Sir Winston's dining hall. And then, you know, 30 years later, me standing in dad's place next to Queen Sir Winston's dining hall. So again, I, I appreciate everybody indulging me in this. Like I said, for me, uh, my folks really love cruise ships. It really put into me. I got to walk on a bunch of them. I didn't get to sail on them, you know, but uh, it was it was fun to see them. And uh, I, I we're never going to see the uh, people keep talking about bringing back the the SS United States. Uh, I I just don't see it happening. I just you know it maybe it will become a hotel someplace. You know they're spending one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year just so it sit there and rot, and it, it's it's a real shame. If the interior was still in it, it'd make a great hotel, but there's nothing left in it. You can stand in one side of the ship and see all the way down to the other side because they ripped out everything because all the asbestos and everything else. It's, it's, it's a real shame. So thanks, appreciate folks joining. And uh, next week I'm going back to the world of World's Fairs and I think I know where I'm going. Uh, I'm trying to confirm it with one other guy and if he doesn't confirm it, I, will, I, I still have a plan B in mind. So I uh, appreciate it. And uh, I, uh, again, if, if people have other suggestions, I do need to get to trains. People have suggested trains. And Tom, you must have a million pictures of cruise ships. Would you like to take us on a trip through, uh, through cruising someday? Sorry, the audio is cutting out. Slides over the years. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll talk to Z and I'll let you know. Yeah, yeah. sure, absolutely. As long as you don't show the ones of us on the ship and me feeding. <laughs> okay, 
I won't, I promise. <laughs> we were supposed to go on a cruise with the Mal Seeds right as the pandemic hit. And we had it yeah. all set. Matter of fact, we had two cruises that year we were going on. Carol and I were going off to the Greek Isles. And then we had one for the full foliage going up to Canada. And we were really looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, had everything booked and, you know, figure out where our cabins were and how close we were together and everything. We had a, a great time when we met on the first ship. And then the, the uh, damn pandemic comes along. So um, I'm hoping next year that things get safer. Uh, and because uh, Carol's never really seen the full foliage and it's full bang. And uh, yeah. we're, we're, we're hoping to do that. Well, we'll hope so. Hopefully we can arrange that. That would be great. So. Great. All right. Thanks. Have a good well, weekend. Kathy, you got your picture. We see the top of your head. So you get you, you got your picture working. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks all. And uh, we okay. will see you next week. And uh, hope everybody has a great thanks. time. And hope the hurricane stays away. Yep. Thank you, Bill. Great. Take care. Take care. All right. Bye.